Yeah, I, I'll jump right into it. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, my name is Oliver Kirsebaum, and I'm the senior staff scientist at Meridian. And on behalf of uh, the entire Meridian team, I'd like to welcome you to uh, this webinar, which is entitled Deep Dive into the Artificial Intelligence Efforts at DFO. And we're hosting this webinar um, together with uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, DFO. So during the next two hours, uh, we will be taking a closer look at the strategy that DFO has developed to manage uh, the large amounts of scientific data that the organization is collecting and also allowing them to leverage novel AI methods to solve ocean related problems. More specifically, we're going to hear about three recent uh, pilot AI projects at DFO addressing uh, detection of vessel behavior, detection and classification of North Atlantic right rail sounds, and lastly, recognition of ocean feature anomalies. Um, and we shall also see how these initiatives align with work that we are doing uh, at Meridian. Now, as you can see from uh, the agenda that you have in front of you, um, we have a busy uh, program to cover in the next two hours. And we have numerous uh, short presentations that will be given by uh, DFO people and also um, by uh, a few of us at Meridian. So uh, we better get underway. Um, after each presentation, there will be time for one or two short questions. Uh, and you can ask those questions either by unmuting yourself or uh, by using the chat box. Um, and uh, in the past, we've had uh, great success with, uh, uh, um, with using that chat box. So I, I really encourage you to, to uh, uh, use it uh, and uh, either by, for asking questions or for uh, uh, leaving comments or, or addressing questions uh, asked by others. Um, if time allows, we will also have a panel session at the end, uh, which will provide an opportunity for more uh, complicated questions to be asked and addressed. Um, finally, I should mention that the webinar is being recorded and the video will be made available uh, through Meridian's YouTube channel uh, within a week or so. And we will also uh, strive to make the slides available through our website. So without further ado, uh, let me pass on the floor to David Collister, uh, who will be giving the first presentation. So uh, David, feel free to uh, share your screen and, uh, and uh, do your presentation. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not used to Zoom either. Can people hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Okay, perfect. I saw a note uh, in the chat saying the audio was breaking up. So please let me know if that happens. Uh, thank you very much, Oliver. And thank you very much to um, the Meridian team for the opportunity to speak to the departmental uh, data strategy and our approaches to um, AI. Uh, my name is David Collister. I'm with the Office of the Chief Data Officer at the department and have overall responsibility for the departmental uh, data strategy. I'm going to try and speak briefly, uh, just take a few moments to um, situate uh, where we are um, with respect to um, uh, uh, provide some background on Government of Canada uh, drivers uh, for AI efforts at uh, DFO and then try and situate um, uh, where our interest is in these specific uh, projects uh, moving ahead. Um, so in 2018, uh, the Government of Canada came out with a report called a Data Strategy Roadmap for the Federal Public Service. And uh, this report uh, identified uh, that there was a need for improved management of data uh, across the government in Canada, and that a whole government approach is needed to, uh, with respect to the creating, protecting, using, managing, and sharing data as a strategic asset to enable informed decisions that lead to better outcomes for Canadians. And one of uh, the key recommendations uh, coming out of that report 
is that there's a need for the government to embrace data-driven innovation and digital technologies, including machine learning in order to accelerate uh, the analytical power available to us, while at the same time ensuring that we protect data privacy, data security, and manage bias and other risks uh, for citizens. So in response to the uh, Government of Canada roadmap, DFO, uh, along with uh, most departments and agencies uh, within the federal government, developed the data strategy. Uh, our data strategy identified 50 com commitments um, that the department uh, will be implementing over the next few years uh, to improve the management and use of our data uh, over four key pillars, uh, including governance, uh, people, uh, digital infrastructure, and valuing data as an asset. And amongst those commitments uh, are a few related uh, to advanced analytics, uh, innovation and experimentation. And um, uh, reaching out and collaborating with external partners. Um, so- David, David, just jumping in just to check, are you, uh, uh, are you still at the first slide or? Because we're no, still seeing the sorry. first slide. Okay, uh, on my computer, I'm on slide five. Uh, is it not moving? It, no, unfortunately not. Um, um, Try hmm. putting it in presentation mode. It is in presentation mode. Oh. Um, David, when you shared your screen, there's a chance you may have shared an application or a second screen instead of an application. Um, often you have two choices, and then we may have gotten one that was stuck on the screen. It says my screen sharing is paused. So I'm going to hit this resume sharing. Can you see it now? So I'm on purpose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, data map. All right. Well, you missed all my beautiful slides, but I'm just going <laughs> to jump uh, on to where I am here. Uh, they're, they're pretty minimal, and we'll be sharing them uh, after the presentation anyway. So, um, so as a result of our data strategy, um, we have been pursuing uh, a number of initiatives over uh, the past year, year and a half. Uh, to advance innovation and experimentation uh, through the use of our data. And, and uh, we started small, um, uh, participating in the CanDev Data Challenge, which was a hackathon over 48 hours uh, with uh, university students. Um, uh, I, I wanna say from, uh, from across the country, but uh, you know, they're, they're primarily localized in, I think, Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, uh, though it was open to whoever wanted to participate. Um, we proposed a, a challenge um, for the team, for uh, teams um, interested in working on uh, our problem, which was to use uh, uh, AIS data, automated identification system data, to help track vessels, uh, which is of interest to the department in order to help avoid uh, whale vessel collisions. Uh, the winning team. Uh, a team of uh, four women um, uh, at University of Ottawa and Carleton University um, won our challenge and went on to come in second place overall um, at the CANDEV uh, uh, hackathon. So, so we were quite proud of that. Um, we then gave them, an, uh, given their, the solution that uh, they developed and uh, it, it formed the foundation for uh, some of the, one of the proof of concepts uh, being discussed later today. We, we took them in as uh, for a week to uh, build upon uh, their solution to uh, look at how we might implement this within DFO. Um, interestingly, that was almost a, a year ago, um, or actually just over a year ago, uh, we brought them in on a Monday, uh, right when COVID was uh, heating up, and we had a long conversation about whether or not we should go ahead at that time. Uh, we decided not to, and then uh, the very next day, uh, the entire office and Government of Canada was uh, sent home uh, for COVID. So it, uh, but it was an opportunity for us as well because we shifted to uh, working with the Tiger team using cloud-based technologies and working remotely, and uh, it was quite successful. Um, we then um, built upon that work to um, uh, look at developing three proof of concepts, uh, which will be discussed today, on how do you on how AI machine machine learning can be used to address various uh, departmental issues. And throughout this all, we've um, been uh, partnering with uh, universities where possible, um, including uh, with Carleton, uh, including um, uh, with York University. Uh, as well as with uh, the Meridian Group and, and Dalhousie. Uh, 
the drivers for um, addressing uh, for innovation and experimentation and moving ahead on uh, trying to find uh, 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 new solutions to departmental problems comes from a number of drivers uh, within the government of Canada. Uh, the, from a few years ago, the results agenda uh, was key for uh, the government. Uh, they wanted an increased focus on aligning the services that, and programs that the department, uh, sorry, that the departments are delivering uh, with uh, specific outcomes for Canadians. Uh, policy and service in digital uh, is a new policy that came out uh, about a year ago, uh, which focuses on enhanced service delivery and effective government uh, operations through integrated management of information and data and leveraging out of technology. And uh, finally, there's uh, the government also came out with a directive uh, for embracing innovation and experimentation and encouraging uh, departments to experiment with new approaches uh, to help uh, the government instill a culture of measurement, uh, evaluation and innovation in program and policy design. So these three drivers have really influenced how we have uh, moved ahead with um, on AI and machine learning. And in particular, the proof of concepts that we have been exploring really need to address real issues and challenges for the department in Canada. Uh, so detecting vessel behavior, uh, proof of concept to be discussed today. Uh, the department has a need to uh, predict where illegal activity uh, might be happening um, within um, fishing areas uh, so that we can effectively uh, allocate resources and uh, manage the information that our uh, conservation and protection officers, our police officers on the water, um, uh, are, uh, how they can effectively manage the information they're receiving. They're receiving uh, data and information from multiple sources and have to um, uh, triage all that information in order to make plans of where to move forward. So we're hoping that AI and machine learning can help with uh, improving the effective use of our resources and predicting where legal activity might be. Whale identification, as many of you might be aware, um, the right whales uh, have moved into the Gulf of St. Lawrence and increasing um, risks of uh, whale vessel collision. This, uh, um, uh, given the endangered nature of uh, these species, um, it's become a government priority to um, uh, manage uh, these collisions, uh, and, uh, including ensuring, and um, it's also having uh, real world uh, economic impacts uh, such that um, we're needing to uh, close down fishing areas and slow vessel traffic uh, in order to um, in order to um, help, help manage these avoidances. So again, uh, in, hoping that improved AI and analytics will help us to uh, minimize uh, economic disruptions and be able to manage potential collisions uh, in close to real time. And as well, anomalous ocean data detection. Uh, 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 data is collected uh, throughout the department through ocean arrays and other sources. And often uh, in order to identify potentially uh, anomalous data, uh, there, there has been put in place uh, quite a number of uh, laborious uh, um, uh, methods for reviewing and managing that data. And we're hoping that again, AI and machine learning will, will help the department in uh, improving the effectiveness uh, in uh, managing uh, uh, anomalous data detection. So um, I'm gonna stop here. I have a slide here on next steps, but I think this is something that uh, we can address towards um, the end after uh, the presenters have had a chance to speak to the proof of concepts that have been done. So I'm gonna st stop here. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take a couple. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to George Esper. Thanks, David, uh, for kicking things off with this uh, nice overview of uh, the DFO data strategy. Um, as I mentioned initially, if you have questions, uh, you can pose them either by unmuting yourself or by uh, typing uh, in the chat box, uh, which we will monitor um, throughout the event here. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And... Thanks, George. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat box. So why don't we just uh, continue to your presentation? Um, okay, can you, <clears throat> excuse me, can you see it? Yep.
Okay. We have more to put it in. Do you want to try to jump to just uh, the next slide and then back again, just to make sure that, yeah, it's working. Good. Okay. Wonderful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you for attending uh, our session. Uh, my uh, my present today, my presentation today is going to focus on the enabling technologies or the platform we're building to uh, help us uh, not only uh, do advanced analytics, but actually to manage our data assets. Uh, to, so to that end, we put together a project called the Target Architecture for Data Analytics Platform. And the goal is to build the tools that are needed for data management and analytics. So it's an enterprise data management platform. We call it the DMP. Uh, lack of imagination here, I, I take credit for that. Uh, so it supports the complete data life cycle. So we capture, so we, we take care of data acquisition using big data technologies, uh, cataloging the data assets. Uh, we have tools for searching and discovery, for processing, analysis, storage, safeguarding, archival and disposal and sharing of departmental data assets. Uh, if anybody has questions, please interrupt. Um, so the context of, of what we're doing here, the, the DMP is really an enabling technologies. Uh, we wanted to manage our assets in uh, at DFO and um, and this is where it fits into the data strategy. So we are the technology pillar. What we're putting together, um, it matches very closely with the data strategy that David just talked about. Uh, so you cannot have something uh, this complex without governance in place. And uh, so just to put it in context, uh, we are the technology pillar. There's the people and culture uh, pillar. Uh, there's the environmental and digital infrastructure, which is effectively processes and technologies. And uh, Treasury Board likes to think of data as an asset, as a pillar. So what we're doing here, uh, what I'm focusing on today is the technology pillar. Uh, so today at DFO, um, if this uh, uh, representation, uh, I think this, represents what we have at DFO and where we'd like to go. Uh, what we have here on the left is what how we manage data at DFO, uh, whether it's uh, digital or uh, hard copy based, we have both, but we don't necessarily have them cataloged and we don't have them in secure storage. So what we're trying to do is organize our cataloging and storage of data assets. So we're looking at a, a classic library model where we uh, we have the data assets for people to uh, to borrow or to make copies of, subject to access control. So not everything is freely available, but for the most part, most of our data is unclassified. And so we're we're following an old library model where you come, <clears throat> search, and then you check out what you want. Uh, we're not taking a big data lake approach. Uh, we think that's more suited down the road when we start doing the analytics, but as an asset management system, uh, we took a different approach. So the data that we make available to our scientists or anybody at DFO, our platform is meant for anybody to contribute to and anybody to, to uh, look up and consume the data that we have. We have essentially three sources of data that we either manage or make accessible. So the first one here is what we're calling our data pipeline. That's really our big data analytics, uh, where we uh, you can think of an internet of things, external sources, um, our sensors in the oceans, our gliders, um, water levels, uh, the works. Uh, what we do is we, uh, our, our platform is geared to take that data, uh, put it in persistent storage, and uh, or make it available through streaming APIs. And people can subscribe to this. And if they want to analyze the data, they can take those data pipeline outputs and combine them into other outputs. So that's the technology for bringing data in. 
Um, the other source is uh, DFO has over 350 applications for managing fisheries and other things. And that data is also available or will be available through APIs. And um, we, we don't manage that data, we, we just have access to it. So we write APIs to extract the data. We can combine data from multiple databases and make that available. Uh, the other uh, source of data that we have, uh, when people catalog uh, their, their data holdings, they also have the capability of uploading the data in a form of files. So we will manage those and make them available through downloads and APIs. So we also publish uh, what is unclassified uh, to the Federal Geospatial Platform. That's a platform managed by Natural Resources Canada. We also publish to the uh, open data, open government portal. And uh, pretty soon we'll be publishing to what we call the API store. That's Treasury Board's uh, API uh, digital for digital services coming in the future. Uh, we'll be delivering not only data, but uh, DFO services. So people will be able to apply for phishing licenses through web services. So we, we took a different approach to analytics. Uh, our scientists made it very clear that our IT governance and IT security and, and constraints didn't allow them to do their work. So uh, when we're building the data management platform, we're really uh, taking that at the heart and we're, we've taken what we call a non-prescriptive approach. So the idea for researchers is to take their data they can go to our catalog, find what they want, take it, we'll give them tools to process the data, and we'll provision workspaces for them to, uh, to, to process the data, store it. Uh, they can create their own mini data lakes if they like, um, and, and run their analytics on that. Uh, they're also uh, free to use any tools or services available through um, 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 uh, um, cloud providers and any other tools they want to download, uh, free, free software, open source software. Uh, and that's all governed by data privacy, security, and ethical use. So this is how it ties in to, uh, to governance. So everything that we do here is tied into our governance framework. And that's it. Um, I didn't want to take too much time. I think the, um, I want to leave as much time for the, uh, for the real good stuff. So if any questions, feel free, free. Thanks, George. Yeah. Um, are there any questions for George? Okay. George, do you see there's a question for you in the chat? Uh, Gatika is asking if there will be a way to see the data dictionary before putting a request for data. Well, there'll be a catalog. Uh, the catalog, if you're going to the open government portal, uh, it, there's a bunch of metadata about the data sets. And yeah, you'll be able to, to see that. Now, if somebody's uploading a file or there's an API, the API will document the, the, the parameters. Uh, and some people can also put a data dictionary to talk about the format of the files. If you have a common bulleted file, for instance, CSV, they could tell you the, uh, the format of the file and, and other things. So it will be up to the publisher of the data to include that kind of information. Thanks, George. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think uh, let's jump to the next presentation um, in the interest of sticking to the schedule here. So next up is um, uh, Reham and Lee and Stephen who will uh, be uh, talking about the first of these three uh, pilot projects, AI pilot projects that DFO has conducted in the last year, uh, which is about detecting vessels behavior uh, using AI. So please, um, whichever of you is handling the slides, uh, feel free to share your screen. Okay, I'll start here, Oliver. Thank you. Can Rina. you see my screen? Yep. Okay, I need to click share. Yep, can you see my screen on your? Yep, we're, we're seeing your okay. presentation slide. 
so okay and are you able to see when i move between the slides perfect yeah okay uh so um i'm here with my colleagues lee croft and steven yang we're gonna speak about the first proof of concept um so the first proof of concept was focusing on how we can use ai to understand uh, and predict vessels behavior so initially we were presented by movement data, visit movement data, so GPS-like data. Uh, we had autonomous identification system and visit monitoring system data. And we wanted to know how we can use AI to detect and gain insights from this data. Um, usually, if you look here to your right, if you plot a visual track, there is no much information or insight you can gain there. Um, so you can see only a visual track with no contextual information. And we wanted to see how we can use AI to predict the visit behavior. Is it stationary along this track? Was it moving? Was it fishing? Um, and based on understanding the visit behavior, then we want to group this visit behavior into clusters based on similar characteristics. So for example, if we are interested in the stationary activity, then we maybe we want to find areas frequently visited by the vessels. Um, maybe if you are interested in fishing, we would like to find hot spot areas of fishing and so on. Later on, once we achieve results from the cluster analysis, we can use it. A regulator can use it to monitor the visual behavior and they can decide within the, whether this behavior is normal or abnormal. Um, for our data, as I said, we had AIS data and we had VMS data. Uh, those are characterized as movement data. They have a spatial dimension, they have temporal dimension. And as part as of the solution, we have explored different toolkits uh, to analyze movement data. And one of them is moving bandas. Um, Steve here, my colleague, will speak to our efforts, efforts in that, on that front. Um, and then uh, we decided to focus and pivot into fishing activities to, to, to predict fishing activities and detect fishing activities. Uh, this was a requirement by the conservation and protection sector at DFO. Uh, for them, the challenge that they had, uh, fishery officers have to be heavily presented in water, air, or in port to monitor the fishing activities. And this is clearly expensive and time intensive process. And we thought maybe we can provide them with bird's eye view over what is happening in the ocean. And we came to the idea of creating AI powered maritime surveillance system. Uh, so how this works initially, so we have the visual monitoring system, movement data. Uh, these movement data pass through step two here, pre-trained predictive models. Those predictive models will identify behavioral markers of fishing. And based on this, conservation and protection can allocate their enforcement efforts accordingly. Okay, so this is a close, more close up look to the predictive models for the fishing detection. Uh, so we started by movement data, clean the data, select, select the data and then clean it, extract the different trajectories. This box here where we have our first predictive model and the first predictive model will predict visual posi positions indicative of fishing activities. Um, and the second predictive model will, uh, will take the result from the first predictive model and then will find the spatial hotspots of fishing activities. The insight we can gain from both, the, both predictive models can be used to um, uh, drive different insights in terms of time, space, or different attributes like the visual time and so on. For the first predictive model, we have taken a work that has been previously proposed by Global Fish Watch. So basically there are a research group at Google who outsourced their predictive model and their data. Uh, it was done initially, developed initially uh, for AIS data. And they have used the average speed, average deviation and course deviation to predict whether a, a vessel is fishing at a certain point or not. Um, Lee will speak to those predictive models. He has used them enhanced the performance of them and made them also applicable to VMS data. Uh, 
With this, I'll hand it to Steve, who will, uh, sorry, I'll hand it first to Lee, who will speak to the two predictive models, and then Steve will speak to our efforts and the movement data analysis. Uh, so Lee, I'll stop sharing my screen here. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so as Reha mentioned, I'm going to go over our work on the uh, application of machine learning models for detecting uh, fishing behavior in vessels. So just switch on the uh, screen sharing here. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple slides here just to describe the process that, that we're using. And then I'm going to switch over and demo some of the applications of the work. So the data that we're dealing with here is in the form of VMS and AIS messages. So these are transmissions that are sent by vessels and they contain information about the vessel identifier, a timestamp, and the position, the speed, and the course of the vessel. And when we have a sequence of these messages from a single vessel, that gives us a track of data. So something that could look like what's shown in the top figure here on the slide. And this vessel track tells us about the behavior of the vessel over time. So our goal here is to be able to apply a classification model so that we can label each point along these tracks as being either fishing or non-fishing activity. Now, in order to do this, we need to first do some data pre-processing so that we can get this in an appropriate form for a classification model. So there are a few steps I'll go over here on that. The first of these is just some basic data cleaning in which we remove any duplicated messages or ones which could be missing values. And this is necessary since VMS and AIS transmissions, uh, they can be subject to data quality issues. Once we've cleaned up the data, what we want to do is then split these vessel tracks into individual trips that are made by each of the vessels. So to do this, we use a distance to shore raster, which allows us to annotate each point along a vessel track with its distance to the nearest point on the shoreline. And we can combine that with information about the speed of the vessels so that we can label these points as either being instances where the vessel is moored or where the vessel is in activity. And from that, we can then split the tracks around the moored points so that we have sequences of um, non-moored points which constitute the trips that are made by a vessel. An example of that is shown in the bottom uh, figure here. So for this particular track, this was split into three different trips which are shown by the different colors here. Now, the final step in the pre-processing is to actually compute the input features that we're going to provide to the classification model. So as Reham had mentioned, the work from Global Fishing Watch has shown that there's a strong correlation between um, fishing activity and the speed and the course of the vessel. So what we do here following their approach is we calculate statistics on vessel speed and course over different sized intervals of time. Uh, so temporal windows, which are positioned over sequences of track points from within the same trip made by a vessel. And we do this for each point along the track. So we're centering these windows on uh, each point and then computing those statistics. So in this way, we have input features that correspond to each one of the points, which can then be passed to the classification model. And it will give us a binary output of either fishing or non-fishing activity. So we've investigated three different predictive models for this purpose. The first of these is a logistic regression model, which is made directly available from Global Fishing Watch. So we were applying that to see how well it performs. As a second model, we've investigated the potential of using an off-the-shelf neural network. And here we've applied a multi-layer perceptron using the Python scikit-learn library. And as a third model, we've looked into um, developing an in-house solution. And here we have implemented a long short-term memory, uh, a type of recurrent neural network using TensorFlow and Keras libraries. So we've done a experimental comparison between these three different models. Uh, the results of these are shown in the table at the bottom here. And this is looking at them over a few different common performance metrics. So we can see from these results that um, our own implementation of the LSTM shown in the bottom row is giving us the best performance here. So once we have a predictive model that's able to give us good performance, um, there are a number of practical applications that we can put this to. So I'm going to switch this over now and uh, demo some of the uses that we can have for this. So one of the obvious applications is if we have a fleet of vessels where we want to be able to monitor them, 
Um, we would like to have a tool which allows us to inspect the trips or the vessel tracks um, and see them annotated with the detected fishing activity. So in this tool shown here, don't read too much into the specific details because this has been anonymized for privacy purposes. Uh, but the general idea is that on the side, we have a slicer here, which allows us to um, pick and choose between different vessels that are being monitored. So each one of these numbers would correspond to a different vessel identifier. And we can expand any of these to see the trips that we've split out for that vessel from the pre-processing. So this one on the top, for instance, <clears throat> there are uh, three different trips that we've split. One of those is selected at the moment. So that's what's being shown on the map here. In terms of the color scheme for these track points, uh, we use a gradient scheme that's fading from red into green. The red points are denoting a low confidence score from the predictive model. Uh, so that's indicating that it's not very likely that there's fishing activity there. And the green points are indicating high confidence scores, so where there is a likelihood of fishing. So for the example that's being shown here, this vessel would have begun from a moored position at the shore. It moves along this track for a while, uh, likely in transit, since it's showing that it's probably not fishing there. And then these green points here are showing that it's probably engaged in fishing activity here for a while. Then it switches back over to some transit, uh, further fishing behavior here, and then transits back to shore again. So this tool essentially allows us to uh, look through different trips that were made by the vessel. We can look through trips that are made by different vessels. The idea is that we're able to inspect these and to visualize where the fishing activity has been detected. Now, if we wanna take this one step farther, we can use the detected fishing activity in order to perform compliance checks for conditions that are uh, specified by fishing licenses that are held by the vessels. So the primary intent with that would be to make sure that when a license specifies a zone within which the fishing activity should be occurring, we wanna be able to verify um, that we've detected fishing activity within the correct zone. So this is an alternate version of the visualization now that's being shown. Um, and here in this one, we've loaded in a shape file that's showing some fishing zones. So those are shown by the blue shaded areas with these light blue lines denoting divisions between those zones. The color scheme here is a bit different for the vessel tracks. Uh, the gray color is now denoting non-fishing activity. So the vessel is in transit there. And if we do detect fishing activity, that's either shown uh, as green points if they are within the correct zone specified by the license, or if they're not within the correct zone, then those would be shown as red points. So on the map at the moment, there's four different trips being shown. So those correspond to these four trips uh, from the vessel. And in the bottom table here, we have one row being shown per trip, giving some uh, extra metadata about those trips. One of those we can see here is highlighted in red. And this is indicating that there was a compliance issue that was detected for this particular trip. So if we click on this, that uh, will zoom in on that trip. And what's happened here is according to the license column specifying the zone within which that vessel should be fishing, we've detected fishing activity that is not occurring within the correct zone. And that's shown by the red points that are uh, on the map here. So again, this is not um, real information that's being shown. This has all been sanitized, but the idea is that with a tool like this, it can be used to flag potential compliance issues. So then there could possibly be um, a follow-up investigation to look into that particular phishing activity. Now I'm going to show one final application of the phishing detection. We may be interested in some cases in looking for high density areas of phishing activity. Uh, this could be useful maybe from a regulation enforcement perspective where we might want to be able to focus attention in areas of high fishing activity. So what we can do here is we can take the detected fishing points from the predictive model and we can look at them over a certain window of time and then apply a density based clustering algorithm. Here we've specifically applied uh, dbscan as the algorithm that we're using and what's being shown on screen in this visualization are some of the clusters that have been detected by VBScan. So each group of differently colored points is showing a different cluster that was found. And these clusters are essentially representative of hotspots of fishing activity. If we want, we can choose to do uh, some filtering on the clusters after they've been reported by the algorithm, which is what we're doing here. These are being filtered based on how many vessels participate in these clusters. Um, so that's controlled by the slider at the bottom. 
Uh, at the moment, it's showing clusters with at least three vessels participating in them. We could, for instance, uh, increase this. So if I bring it up to five, that uh, refines the clusters that we're seeing. So these are ones in which there's a, a greater magnitude uh, fishing activity. So this is one way that we could choose to look at these um, fishing hotspots. An alternate way we could do this is rather than looking at only a single window of time, we could apply the same process over multiple windows of time in sequence. And when we do that, we can basically interpret what we have as a time series over these windows. So we could then step through that time series. So in this version of the visualization, uh, clusters are shown as a heat map here, since it's a little bit easier to see this way. And the idea is that we have windows of time that are sized 10 days. And by clicking this, it's going to uh, cycle through those windows. So this allows us to see uh, sort of an evolution of the fishing activity over a certain period of time. Uh, here, it's roughly a few months. So this can be a way that we can uh, look at maybe a higher level of this to get an idea of how trends or patterns in fishing activity uh, are changing over time. Okay, so that concludes what I have for the demo here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Leah. Thanks, Raham. Um, Raham, did you want to say something? I just wanted to, yeah, you jumped in, that's fine. Okay, that's so every, you. you can see my slides? Yeah, looks fine. Perfect, thanks. Okay, so uh, on to uh, trajectory level of things that we have looked at. Um, we are going to, I'm going to show you some of the trajectory level processing that we have looked at, which generally speaking includes uh, outside of data cleaning and prediction of at the point noise level. We're talking about building trajectories. And so this is talking about constructing from individual points into broader patterns of uh, the, the movement of the vessels that you can broadly speaking think of as forming some kind of a line or string. So there are many ways to go about doing this. And uh, one of the ways that we explored within the context of this particular proof of concept is using a package, an open source package called Moving Pandas. And uh, I don't work for them, but I'll just quickly uh, tell you a little bit about why we ended up using this. So Pandas is the base package that uh, in Python you can use to load uh, data frames and so on. It's very powerful. It's for a large data set manipulation. It's uh, very, very useful for time series processing. There's a lot of built-in functions and classes for that. It's very memory efficient for sparse data representation. So this is when you have data that has a lot of empty or null values and it's performance optimized and, and uh, it obviously integrates really well with the Python, um, or with the entire Python set of libraries. So from there, there is a, a package which is also open source called GeoPandas, which is built on top of Pandas. And this inherits things like uh, Pandas object properties. It's basically everything you can do with Pandas, you can do with GeoPandas uh, data frames. Uh, or geodata frames, they call it. And this adds geometry support, which uh, you, know, you can use a coordinate reference frame and you can specify what coordinate system data points are gathered in and what the coordinates themselves were, which allows you to do things like geometric operations. And uh, this integrates really well with uh, common spatial file formats like shape files, for example. Uh, and then moving pandas is built on top of GeoPandas. So specifically, it looks at considerations for spatial temporal objects. So these are movement data. So things that vary spatially, but also change in time. And uh, at the moment, it is looking at pointwise changes. So it doesn't do aerial changes just yet, but uh, it allows you to build trajectories, which are time order series of geometries. And this integrates really well with GIS tools, for example, QGIS. And there's a web address that you can look up on this. So why build trajectories? The first thing is I want you to think about the behavior of ants. So when you look at the behavior of a single ant, they don't usually do this, but you can ask a question what, what the ant is doing. And if you're looking at a single ant, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So then you look at 10 ants and it still doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not until you get to something like a thousand or more ants that larger patterns are starting to emerge. They're taking care of the young, they're competing for resources, they're, they are uh, combating other types of ants and so on and so forth. So those kind of behaviors that you're seeing is an emergent type of behavior, which is derived from looking at the collective interaction of, of a lower level system of things. So in this case, vessel trajectories, they are emergent behavior of a data point of, of pointwise um, data. So you can use this type of data to build trajectories, look at general behaviors of vessels. And a good example of this is 
a U-turn symbol. Everybody understands what a U-turn is when they look at that on the street. But the fact is, if you look at this at a very fine point-wise level, it's going to be very difficult for you to identify what, the, what a vehicle is doing at that particular point in time. You can have no notion of what a U-turn looks like. So this is, these are some of the main reasons why to look at trajectories is to examine higher order behaviors and patterns, but there are also other types of good, uh, good examples for why, um, good situations for why you should build trajectories from, from data points. And these generally speaking break down into segmentations. You can break tracks into segments. Uh, you can look at similarity analysis between different types of trajectories. You know, is a vehicle, is a vessel making a U-turn, is it not? Um, clustering. Uh, clustering trajectories together based on the similarity, outlier detection, classification of trajectories to different behaviors like U-turns, uh, different kind of turns, whatever they're doing. You can do hotspot detection of different types of behaviors. You can do pattern detection. So this is again, detecting things like U-turns and so on and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of different good reasons for this. One of the problems that, that uh, you encounter dealing with AIS data is that um, it's very noisy. Um, and it contains a, a, a lot of uh, the data packets are, trans, uh, are transmitted in real time, and the sampling is is variable. And there's a, the as, as GPS drift in and out a lot, and different kind of weather conditions coming in and out. These uh, these vessel trajectories can, would have to be built um, from from very noisy data, but that's not usually what uh, is done for large amounts of data because you're mostly just building over noise, and this is a very time consuming process. So you take approach uh, you take an approach which is called trajectory generalization. And it's an idea that's borrowed from cartographic generalization. So if you build a map, you understand that uh, the contours of the map are, it's like, the, it's a fractal-like behavior where depending on the level uh, that you want, that you scale this to, you're looking at different contours depending on what the scaling of the, map, of the map is. So for every particular type of scaling, you need to come up with a notion of what the, the, the reality looks like roughly at that scale. So generalization is exactly this idea. It takes different kinds of trajectories which are built from points and it tries to produce a general behavior which is relevant to your observation at the scale at which you, you want to make that observation. So a lot of movement data, like I said, is a whole lot of noise and you want to be able to effectively remove that noise. So you're trying to preserve for the scale of the behavior of the interest, you're trying to preserve things that are interesting to you which is usually bigger than the scale of data variability which is usually bigger than the noise that's contained in the data. And it also allows you to do something different, which is privacy transformation. So you can strip out a lot of very specific information about the vessels. And after you generalize them, it's difficult to tell apart exact size of the vessel from looking at the tracks unless you, you know exactly what to look for at that particular level. Um, it, turns, it takes out specific turns, it takes out specific data points and so on that makes it harder to identify the data in you know, tracking it back to a specific uh, vessel. So this is the main reason for why you need to do this. And it also allows you to do things like searching trajectories, retrieving trajectories, interchange, uh, do a lot of visualization of large amounts of data sets, which are very dense and uh, approaching the size of big data or is big data, and do, allows you to do level analysis on generalized data. So there's a very short animation on the bottom that one specific type of generalization where basically you're connecting between the, the most significant points of change. It could be, could be the, the points where um, the turn, is, turn rate is the greatest or uh, some, some other vessel behavior change is the greatest. So this is one type of generalization algorithm. So using the AIS data that we have and using a particular type of generalizer that's built into moving pandas called the minimum distance generalizer, using a tolerance of about 100 meters. So here's what the result looks like. The original data is on the top left and this is um, in the Vancouver Harbor. You can see that within the yellow box, here's a trajectory of a set of vessels. I don't know if that's one or two, but uh, it's sort of traversing. And in this case, it's a cargo ship that's just moving around in, in that particular region for that day. And when we generalize this particular trajectory, and you can see on the bottom right of this particular uh, set, uh, this slide, you see that the trajectory is smoother, the jags are gone, the noise is gone, and the behavior is preserved. So if you've done it right for the scale of interest of the feature, this is what it's supposed to look like. And this is generalization. There's also a whole another thing called the trajectory aggregation. So aggregation here. Steve, yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna be, ask you to be mindful of time, uh, um, just to, so we don't run too much behind schedule. Um, right. Okay, I'll wrap it up. All right, so aggregation, basically you are trying to add different kinds of clusters together to try to visualize them together. And this is really useful technique for large amounts of data, like big data. So I'm not gonna talk too much more about this. I'll just show you what it looks like when you've done it. So the same harbor, same set of data, you notice that there is a, uh, in Magenta is a passenger ship or many different entire passenger ships that goes back and forth between the harbor. So these are ferries and after, uh, aggregating the trajectory together on the right hand side, you see this is the result. It gives you significant points and computes the flow between them and shows you the general behavior. And this is useful for plotting large amounts of data. 
So using the same fashion, we can look at uh, the view, uh, an overall view of the Vancouver hub. And you can look at things like uh, a fishing vessel coming close to a marine protected zone. Uh, and you can look at the general behavior patterns around the St. Uh, Lawrence Gulf, where these things are, um, and get a national view of the vessel traffic. So this is all that I have to say for this topic. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And, and thanks uh, before you to Reham and Liev, uh, Lee for, for this nice presentation on your work with uh, the detection of vessel behavior. Um, we're going to skip questions in the interest of time and move on to the next presentation, but uh, uh, I, I take some comfort in the fact that there's been a lively discussion in the chat uh, with, with questions uh, asked and answered. Uh, and so uh, if you haven't noticed uh, or been keeping an eye on the chat box, uh, I'd just like to direct your attention to, uh, to the discussion that's going on there, some really interesting points. Um, but we are going to move on now to the next presentation, uh, and that's you, Jim. Uh, Jim is going to talk about the second AI pilot uh, project, uh, which uh, is concerned with um, detection and classification of uh, vocalizations uh, from uh, whales, uh, specifically the North Atlantic white whale. So please, Jim, take it away. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so in correction of uh, Oliver's earlier introduction, not everybody involved has been with uh, Meridian or um, Fisheries and Oceans, uh, though David Collister brought me in, I guess initially to work on the CANDEV um, data challenge. And uh, I've had a both interesting and humbling uh, last 16 months or so working with some fantastic people, but I am independent. Okay, um, so oops. So the the POC two the the proof of concept two was to look at applying machine learning techniques or AI techniques to the classification of acoustic uh, vocalizations by North Atlantic right whales, and there I'm not going to talk about a lot of the the details, but those are going to follow. But I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of North Atlantic right whale. Just for those of you who are not aware, are endangered. They're listed under the Species at Risk Act and protected as such. Um, adult lengths run between 14 and 18 meters. That's a large animal, 30 tons, 30 metric tons, um, and has a, a wide range of vocalization characteristics. This work is focusing on classifying only the upcall, upcall being one of the more um, common um, vocalizations by the animals and are often found just by themselves, whereas the others sometimes are found in mixtures. Um, so this work is focusing on the up call, which is the first one on that list. And so a traditional approach would be of uh, doing this would be to have some sensor in the water that listens using hydrophones typically uh, for right whales or for other things, generates a, a time series. That time series is, is converted into a frequency domain. Uh, so basically uh, on the, the vertical axis of the spectrogram is frequency on the horizontal axis is time and you're given some type of structure. Uh, those are then fed to a, uh, a user and a person who recognizes what the, the structure would be, such as the up calls and the, the various calls from a um, North Atlantic right well. So we're changing that a little bit. Um, so an alternate approach would be to pull features out of that. Um, so one could actually look at in which people like Mark Baumgartner at, at who we have done and others have done where they, they look at the the spectrogram, they do some type of feature analysis and they classify the features and then run them through people to make some type of final decision and, and see if it's really a, a um, what they're looking for, a, in this case, a right whale. There is also taking another approach similar to that where you take the time series, extract features directly. Okay, hopefully. So when I say those features, if you, if you have a user that 
uh, looks at that spectrogram, he's really only able to look in two dimensions, frequency and time. Well, three, you, you could have an intensity part of it. And if you use color, you can, you can get to various things, but it's really a very small dimensionality. If you look at say what um, the psychoacoustics people, how, how humans would actually uh, classify sounds by listening to them and how they perceive them, um, you end up with up to 58 separate uh, uh, features being pulled out. And um, I think Nicole's gonna talk about this particular slide, but you see the dimensionality actually gets quite a bit larger. And this, I'll give Wilfried Beslan some uh, credit for this because uh, he's the one who generated it. It's really based on Carolyn Binder and Victor Young's work. Okay, so, and what this whole AI approach does to us that we can't do otherwise is that now we can start combining features in dimensions that in some ways we might be able to do through things like principal component analysis or there are other techniques that basically bring the number features down to a smaller number for people to look at. Um, but you're basically still starting to lose information. What the, the AI approach isn't limited by that. And what this uh, diagram is showing is really what um, Oliver and Nicole are going to talk about shortly. Um, and so Young Lin is actually going to talk a little bit about how he's actually migrated the, the top part of that, the spectrogram. So one of the ways to do the spectrogram AI approach would be to do a two-dimensional uh, uh, image classification. And that would be like identifying pictures. Huge amount of work being done on that. Alternate approaches would be to, to filter out various components of it, but still be left with time series and do one dimensional uh, neural network type work. And then a, a third approach would be to take this these features, these 58 features, and then start adding those to the feature space. And then by doing this, not only are, are we able to use AI for a multi-feature um, classification that's just not possible otherwise. But it also allows us to actually start thinking about other things. We classify vessel sounds, do all kinds of different types of things. Okay, I'm keeping the, trying to keep this short, but I would like to acknowledge that um, there's a large number of people working on this project, um, which is why it, we have, uh, uh, in fact, two presentations. And uh, in particular, I'd like to, th to thank David Collister at the bottom left, who is really behind a lot of this in his foresight. Um, but also Stan Matwin from the Meridian side and Fabio, who um, is in been instrumental in trying to train us on uh, transfer learning and on some of the issues on trying to bring some of these, um, these uh, uh, classification models to low power processors. So we can actually uh, deploy them to the processor or to the sensor themselves, which is not being discussed in this part. Um, should also make sure that I acknowledge that I'm not the only uh, non-DFO person or non-Meridian person. Dave Flagerus has actually been in here helping us a lot. And then a lot of the work is really based on the background of work being done by others. And I already mentioned Carolyn Binder and Victor Young, Paul Hines also was at DRDC, but also Florian and Yvon Samar from DFO Quebec region. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to, I think Young Lin next. Yes, thanks Jim. And apologies for incorrectly labeling you as a DFO man. That's okay, I, I, uh... I did work for DFO at one point. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to, if there are any questions, we're going to save those for a little later. I think it would be natural to take those after Nicole's presentation. Uh, but first up after you, Jim, we have uh, Young Lin, who's going to talk about his efforts with uh, using uh, Keto's package um, um, uh, for, for the detection classification or, of North Atlantic right whale. Uh, sure, okay. I will take uh, this. Uh... I will take the screen right now. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. So you can see my screen, okay. Uh, hi, uh, hello everyone. 
uh, I'm going to talk about the use of the heaters in DFO for North Atlantic wheel detection. Uh, first of all, thanks to Meridian Group to provide heaters this tool and make it open source so that we can use it for our project. Uh, Keters is a software package for acoustic data analysis and in DFO, it is used for detection and classification tasks in underwater acoustics, especially to detect the wheel based on sound. So we call it up course. Keters is written by Python and use lots of uh, packages, for example, NumPy, Pandas, and also it, it supports HDFS, uh, especially its model are fully built on the largest deep learning framework, TensorFlow. So it is easy to be compatible with the deep learning and the TensorFlow. So for, for heaters, it includes three deep learning models. One is the ResNet, second one is the sub inception. inception. The third one is DenseNet. They provide the enough deep for the deep learning neural, net, neural network so that we can customize it, uh, these models a little bit based on some configurations. Uh, as mentioned before, the scenario looks like this. In the real application, an instrument hydrophone is deployed at somewhere, so it can detect some sounds around it within a certain distance. No matter what is detected, it will record it as audio file, so that the audio file is processed and converted to the image by using some feature extraction technologies. We call it spectrograms. And then we can see uh, a spectrogram is a visual way of representing the signal strength or loudness of a signal over time in a particular waveform. We can notice that the difference between these two spectral uh, two spectral uh, uh, two spectrograms, the sound with the wheel is quite different with the sound without the wheel. So Keters can easily distinguish them by using its deep learning model and detect the wheel accordingly. Imagine if we make the detection real time or near real, near real time, we can use it to, to detect wheels in some specified area to warn ships or vessels to avoid the wheels or other big objects. Currently, we have some data set, two of them provided by Keters. We can see the data set one and the data set two. They are both provided by Keters. And then they have the training data, uh, training data set, validation data set. All of the, all of the data set are annotated or labeled. We, all, we also have the third data set we downloaded from WHOI. It's, it's wood whole ocean graphic institution. But for this one, it is pretty old and we only have a small amount of the data set, but we still want to try, to try it on Keters to see how it performs. Okay, this is the step we, we are taking for the detection. We have data pre, uh, we have data preparation, we have pre, so we have signal processing. We also train the model, evaluate model and select model to see how it how good it is. At the first beginning, we have audio files, we have annotations, and then Wave files, signal files to the image uh, to the image file to make it become 2D image, and then we use the training data set to train the train the uh, train the above three models, and we do the model training works. After that, we comp we compare them to select the best model, so that we finish the model selection step, and then we use the test. Uh, afterwards, we evaluate them to still use different metrics to see how good they are, and then we use the testing data set to make the real detections. Basically, we're trying to stick our work, uh, detection workflow with the um, machine learning pipeline. Uh, even, if, uh, even if it's not fully automated, but we still try to make it uh, more formal from the machine learning pipeline point of view. And we compared the three, uh, we compared this, uh, after we finished the model training and model selection, we compared the three deep learning models. All the experiment and comparison are conducted in the identical settings. So we use different uh, metrics 
to a wide bias. For example, we use categorical accuracy, precision, and reports. They are all very reputable classification metrics for machine learning. And we also, uh, we also compare, evaluate them on individual data set, for example, data set one, to A, to B. And also we have uh, all data set, which will aggregate, combine all the data set together to do the final comprehens comprehensive evaluation. After the, uh, after the comparison, we realize that uh, ResNet and Inception, seem, uh, they both perform better than DenseNet, so DenseNet is out. After a uh, further exploration and investigation, we decide ResNet, this kind of deep learning model will be used our final detection models. So far, we have finished the model training and the selection. Before we, we described our first approach, uh, we call it one-shot detection. We take the whole audio file to detect at one time, at one shot. We also introduced the second approach, which we call it a sliding window. It is straightforward. So it simply slides a specified, specified wide window across the audio file, such, such as one second, two seconds, or three seconds, and use the classifier to determine if, if a wheel up call is present, present within the window at any given instance. During, the, uh, during this approach, we realize that, uh, during this approach, we generate lots of scenarios. Uh, uh, however, we only pick a few of them to show the significant difference. Uh, we, 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 notice, we notice that for the precision score, it increased, uh, it improved a lot. Uh, so it means that with granular portion of the audio, it can detect more view up calls. However, we also realized two things. For example, for the record score, it, uh, with the smaller portion of the audio, more noise and background sounds are detected as view up calls as well. So uh, it introduced some false positive detection. Uh, this is something we maybe want to take into account in the future. So F1 score is a combination of free season score and record score. So it will change accordingly as well. So we also applied the same thing on the data set three uh, about WHOI data set, even if we want to see how, uh, it, uh, how our Peters models will perform based on this data set. Uh, because we only have 12 audios, so they are all true positive. There is no need to show precision because precision score is always one. So uh, we want to see, even, we, we want to see, even if the quality of data set three is, quite, uh, is, is not good enough, it's pretty, uh, because it is pretty old, go back to 1981, uh, and in addition, we were trying to do a very difficult things. For example, we train the model on a data one on one data set and test and detect on another different data set. This is a very difficult scenario for machine learning. However, Kitos still can detect some of the wheel up calls. It is not easy for Kitos. It shows the strength of Kitos capabilities to detect such kind of sounds, sub kind of up calls. And then, uh, afterwards, we get the output, get the result from our detection. We trying to visualize it because we, we want to bring such kind of visualization to uh, a more practical use case. We can, uh, first of all, because we don't have the real location information, we, we synthesized some location information, for example, longitude, long, uh, latitude, and also time series information. And then, if we know if we notice there's a yellow yellow dot, it represents a hydrophone is deployed there. So sound around it will be will be detected, and because we can detect lots of sound, lots of dots, so we only show the detect wheel up cost. So we realize the result in three locations. For the first one is Gulf of Lawrence, just like this. The second one is Bay of Fundies. And for the third one, we have some real uh, hydrophone location information. We have totally four uh, hydrophone locations. Two of them are deployed in Shenani Bank. One is in the Emirate base, and the, the third one, the fourth one, is at Stone Fence. So based on the, based on this information, we can uh, see uh, at the yellow dot where the hydrophone is deployed. Uh, it, it can detect the more as the wheel cost around it. Actually, the red, the red spot represents the wheels 
movement or the wheels existence, the, the actual hydrophone uh, deployment or visualization should be, should, should be different like this. However, we want to show if the wheels show up around the hydrophone, we should have some chance to detect it based on the uh, kitters and based on the detection based on the hydrophone deployment. Uh, so that's all about the uh, using kitters as the detection tool to, to detect the North Atlantic up, uh, wheel up cost. Uh, thank you and questions. Thank you, uh, Yong Lin. Uh, let's just do a quick little question here. There's a question from Rui Zhang asking about the selection of the window size and the threshold. And, and then after that, we'll move on to Nicole's presentation. OK, so what are you looking at? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'll read it for you. So uh, the question is, how do you select the parameters, window size, and threshold for different scenarios if a thorough grid search is not possible? What are the, the guiding principles there? Uh, actually, there is no guiding. Uh, there is no guiding principles there. Uh, we will, uh, from our case, we try to do a comprehensive grid search. Well, we want to try a big set of the sliding window size or threshold to see which is, which one is the best combination for them. Uh, so because based on uh, based on the window size, we will um, maybe improve the accuracy of wheel detection. However, on the other side, we maybe also introduce some false, positive, false positives. So in that case, we need to balance it, find a trade-off between the sliding window size and also the accuracies. Thank you, Yonglin. Um, there's another interesting question that uh, about temporal context. I think we're going to try to come back to that uh, at the end of today's event, uh, if time allows. Um, but uh, right now, we're going to move on to the next presentation uh, by Nicole uh, Chisholm. Nicole, uh, please go ahead and share your slides. Uh, OK. Thank you. Can everyone see? Yep. So there's been previous uh, work done, uh, ResNet work using spectrogram representation uh, from this paper, and they use deep neural networks to identify the uh, right whale up call. So a ResNet uh, that's used for image recognition was trained to recognize the time frequency characterizations of the right whale up calls. Uh, they ended up achieving a recall of 80% while maintaining a precision above 90. So now we want to improve our accuracy uh, with these models. And since the spectrogram representation isn't the only way to represent uh, sound, we want to explore the oral representation. Auditory features are meant to describe sound as it is perceived by the brain. So first we need to process the sound through a model of the auditory system. So it starts by inputting sound, which then we filter sound to account for the transmission through the outer and middle ear. And then we uh, break it into subbands with psychoacoustic filter banks, and this outputs uh, spectrotemporal features. And we can also calculate the perceived loudness spectrum to get pure spectral features. So this is a summary of all the auditory features that one could use for classification uh, and the relationship uh, between one another. The lightest shades at the bottom are what uh, is used to train a classifier with uh, 58 in total. And then each category depends on the different types of information you have. So specifically in the orange, oh, uh, specifically in the orange, the uh, temporal, uh, spectral temporal category uh, generally is more useful for classifying marine mammal uh, vocalization. So this oral representation has been used by uh, Binder and Hines in their 2014 paper. So they used oral features, but uh, used uh, conventional uh, statistical machine learning that consisted of PCA and uh, Gaussian-based Bayesian classifier. 
overall their accuracy for all the vocalizations of the testing set was 85%. But as you can see in the table and the figure, the uh, right whale in black had some overlap with the humpback and bowhead. So our question is, how can we combine the oral representation with deep learning? And with that, I'll hand it off to Oliver for this slide. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, this is the uh, last slide of this presentation. So we're now back uh, looking at uh, uh, the same slide that Jim uh, brought up uh, on the screen earlier. So this is our, our current approach here that we're just um, starting to investigate now. Um, where we are uh, looking to combine what we know already works quite well as shown by, by our work and by the work of Yong Lin and, and his team. Uh, so the spectrogram approach in which you um, ask or you train a uh, image classification uh, deep neural network such as a ResNet. Um, and that's illustrated here by the blue box 2D convolutional neural network. So you train a network like that to uh, recognize the upcalls as represented in, um, in the spectrograms. And we already have seen that, that these networks can uh, be trained to achieve a uh, nice performance. And now what we're trying is to build a multi-modal model. So a model that considers not only the spectrogram representation, but also the, the oral representation. And here we have a couple of choices and then we're gonna explore both paths. In, in one path, uh, we're gonna try to take the, the filtered signals uh, as they are and pass those through a, a 1D convolutional neural network, um, at least initially. Uh, further down the road, we may try to replace this uh, purple pink component with a different architecture, but um, the essential idea remaining the same, namely that we take the filtered signals through a, a, some type of a neural network and then uh, join the feature space uh, learned uh, by these two networks uh, and then passing that on to a final classification um, uh, uh, set of layers. So that's one um, avenue that we're going to explore. And then uh, the other uh, avenue is uh, taking uh, not only the filtered signals, but also the uh, features as computed with uh, the psycho uh, and uh, acoustic model. So these were the 58 features or so that Nicole was referring to and taking that uh, and combining that with the features extracted by the uh, uh, 2D convolutional neural network and see if that can um, enhance the classification performance. So this is, um, I, this is uh, sort of uh, um, where we are now and, and, and soon we'll have some, some first results here we, we expect. Uh, and so we're very uh, um, interested to see if, if this can give us an edge in terms of, for instance, uh, uh, separating uh, some of these classes that we saw on the previous slide, the, separating the right whale up calls from uh, um, the, for instance, the humpex, although that's known to be a challenging uh, classification problem. Um, great. So I think that uh, concludes uh, the trio of presentations on uh, the AI pilot project two on uh, classification of North Atlantic right whale up calls. Um, I didn't quite follow the last discussion in the chat box. Uh, were there any questions um, there? Right, I see there's a question from Val Vares that Val is asking about um, the specific of the, the 1D CNN. I think maybe we'll, uh, that would take us a little too far. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question, Val, but I'm afraid that we're a little short on time. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna suggest, I'm gonna um, encourage some, uh, some of the experts out there to perhaps take that up in the discussion thread in the, please keep that discussion going, that lively uh, discussion going in the chat box. And then uh, meanwhile, we'll move on to the next presentation here. Um, 
and that will be by Reham uh, and uh, Steve, I believe, that will talk about uh, the pilot project three that concerns uh, detection of anomalies in ocean data. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Oliver. I was wondering, can you see the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the third proof of concept was to cluster and detect anomalies in ocean data. Um, and in attempt to formulate this problem, we needed to understand how the data format for CTD data or conduct the data scope we were interested in was conductivity, temperature, and depth data. And we wanted to understand what is actual what does it actually mean to cluster and find anomalies in CTD data. Uh, for this proof of concept, we had the Ocean Science, Science Division uh, within DFO as partners and as subject matter experts. So um, as a first attempt, we tried to understand the data, what happens actually that there are research missions and scientists go into research missions to uh, measure the temperature and salinity along uh, different depths at the ocean. So they pick one water column and then they would measure the temperature and salinity. After the end of one mission, they come up with this profile here. It's called Argo profile, where they have the temperature and salinity measured at different depths. We have several dimension here. So we have a uh, time dimension, we have a spatial dimension, we have the temperature, we have salinity, and it is also measured at different depths. And we needed to, you know, close this gap between ocean science and data science to understand how can data science help in this problem. And then our data was unlabeled. Uh, one requirement for the ocean science division is that how can they use this data uh, to find anomalies within the data or, uh, or to control the quality and flag profiles that have bad quality. Uh, so the interest was in applying and supervised machine learning techniques. And the question we tried to answer is that how can we identify similarities or the lack of similarities uh, between multidimensional profile of oceanographic data? Uh, the multidimensional factor comes from the fact that it is measured at different depths. Um, answering this question can help us understand, for example, how heat is distributed in the ocean and to identify coherent patterns. Um, the result of the clustering analysis in general can be used to quality check ocean profile data, find anomalies, or to recognize dynamic changes in the ocean. Uh, it was a bit of a tricky problem because, um, uh, as I said, we needed to understand what does it mean in the context of ocean science, and there are many factors to take into consideration. Should we take special uh, direction, special dimension into consideration or not? So we ended up looking into research. What did researchers do previously? And we did come through those three papers. The three of them have used the same approach and supervised technique to cluster the ocean data and to detect phenomena uh, from this ocean data. So they were applied to different domains, but the Pacific Ocean was not one of them. For our data, our area of study was in the Pacific Ocean. So it was interesting to apply the same approach and our Pacific region data to see uh, what kind of insights we can get come, uh, come up with. So we have used actually the third paper here. Uh, the third paper here um, has outsourced the model that they have used, um, and that's was the basis for our experiments. So the solution approach depending, depends on identifying changes on the vertical structure. So we take one whole vertical structure of temperature profile, salinity profiles, or both combined, and to capture the physical change to the whole water column. Um, once we do this, uh, we have identified groups or clusters of measure of measurements. And although we didn't take spatial, although those papers recommended not to take spatial dimension into the clustering process, still the results were able to represent spatially coherent uh, large scale water masses. Uh, using the cluster analysis, we can study the spatio-temporal dynamics and to identify uh, abnormal climate patterns. 
So this is the tool that we have used. And as I said, it is one of the tools that were provided by one of the papers. So what you see here, uh, this was applied to the North Atlantic Ocean, I think. For us, we did apply the same concept to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so we have started here, each line of those is a profile that measures both temperature and salinity at different depths. What you, later on we have clustered those profiles into different clusters and we have used a data-driven model. Um, so we started by the heat contents and then we applied them later to both the temperature and salinity. And we have uh, classified and clustered those profiles into different clusters. The result is that you can see, although the spatial dimension was not considered, it is still, uh, we were able still to create clusters uh, of coherent regions in the ocean, especially coherent region, regions. And this is the link to the package we have used. Um, I think uh, now Steve will get, give us a closer look at the experiment results we have conducted. Um, yeah, and with the, uh, with this, I hand it to you, Steve. Let me... Great, thank you, Rianne. I uh, hope you can all see my screen. Yeah. Looks Great. Good. So for all the scientists in the room and people who are science enthusiasts and those who are just curious, uh, one of the biggest question that oceanography uh, addresses is state of changes in the ocean. But for those of you who don't know, why do we profile and study the ocean? And here are some very interesting modern perspectives. And here's one from global, uh, well, climate change or global warming perspective. So if you Google around and you can find that uh, almost all of the energy that the earth is expected to increase in terms of surface uh, heat content is gonna be dumped or absorbed by the ocean. And this is a signal that we're, we're seeing from profile in the ocean. Uh, but also it, it makes sense intuitively given that this is a large water mass and it has a very large heat capacity relative to other types of minerals and soil and so on. So this is a huge concern. So we need to be able to understand how the ocean is, is evolving through time to understand um, the kind of things that we need to do to try to mitigate against the effects of climate change. This is just one perspective. And at some point in time, here is a quick animation from 2016, the, the middle to the end of 2016. So for those of you who don't know, uh, there is a little box on the top that's close to the northern side of, uh, well, on the shore of uh, BC, uh, where you're going to see this formation of the blob, which is a thermal anomaly event that occurred in the ocean that resulted in a mass of warm water. And if you remember the winter here in Canada, it was very abnormal during the time of the uh, blob. So this thing formed sometime in the, in the summer of 2016 and fizzled out uh, as we got really, really close to the, uh, the mid part of winter there. And this animation here was stopped sometime in uh, October and you can see the formation and partial dissipation of this particular anomaly. This is a type of an ocean, uh, ocean anomaly that we'd like to be able to detect, uh, at least as scientists working in, the, in that particular discipline. So we got data, a large amount of data from uh, the Vancouver, uh, from, the, from the west side and uh, west side of Canada. And this is the data that uh, DFO has in its possession, but this is just some of the data. This doesn't include any of the east side data. And you can see um, from 1980 to 2020, there is a large amount of data and most abundant, uh, the most abundant region is, is around the Vancouver Island vicinity where I think a lot of the surveys start and, um, and finish in. So as Reham already said, uh, the techniques that we're gonna use to look at this data comes from this particular paper, which looks at coherent heat patterns revealed by unsupervised classification. And in that case, they used Argo temperature profile. So for us, we're gonna be using something a little different, which is our own DFO data. And the, the way that this, this particular algorithm works is imagine you plot a whole lot of these temperature profiles that go down to some depth. Um, they're going to have variable depth, so you can trim the data to wherever you find is necessary. And these profiles are going to have different kind of shapes, and they're going to they're exhibit uh, a certain type of a probability distribution. And so these probability distribution functions for these different types of profiles gives you an idea roughly like the different kind of behaviors you expect to see in the ocean regardless of where it is, so regardless of geospatial coordinates. And be, to be able to have these, these uh, probability density functions as a function of depth means that you can now do cool things with it. And one of the things that you can do is to start modeling them in terms of clusters at every discretization of depth. So let's say for every five or 10 meters, you create uh, one category and you say that within here, I'm going to fit some clusters to that PDF distribution. And in this case, we're you know, following the methodology de de derived in uh, Mazzi et al. And they used a uh, Gaussian mixture modeling, which is a type of model 
that looks at overlapping uh, clusters, which are roughly uh, Gaussian in terms of their uh, distribution. And the algorithm then tries to find an optimal number of clusters for each one of these depth quantizations, and that will become the maximum number of clusters. So then after doing this process, you are fitting these different types of clusters to each depth, and all of those are rescaled internally. So each depth is just as important as another in terms of its control on the output variability of this particular um, uh, of the of the of the supervised uh, supervised cl uh, classification process. So these all these different depths, there's going to be a lot of them, and also when you're using also salinity and uh, temperature, there's also a doubling in terms of number of dimensions, and so this creates a ton of different features, and these features needs to be squashed down using some kind of algorithm so that we're not. Um, looking at an intractable problem here where the number of features is on the order of or getting very close to the number of data points for these clusters. So squishing down the number of features using this feature selection process, so the algorithm internally uses something called principal component analysis, which tries to look at variability and takes the data cloud and the data cloud of the feature scatter and looks at the maximum uh, spans and so on and so forth and formulates new coordinates out of the old ones and using a reduced number of coordinates to try to represent the maximum amount of variability that exists within the data up to a certain limit. So this is something done internally in the algorithm. And this process then leads you to be able to build a model the probability density, density uh, function for all the different kind of profiles you see. And on the bottom right, you can see that each one of these um, profiles is deconvoluted into its constituent clusters. So you can think of this as a deconvolution process for those of you who uh, does signal processing. And then this creates a different kind of Gaussian mixtures and different kind of clusters. So doing it through this particular mechanism allows you to look at the different kind of clusters which have different kind of behaviors. So here are 10 different clusters for the summer. Um, a summer data from 1980 to 2020. And the component zero, for example, is a type of a, a type of a cluster which exhibits this kind of particular behavior in the uh, in, in the depth space in terms of temperature. And so component one looks like this. And so you can see, generally speaking, these are all very, very different looking components. And then the blue line and the uh, green lines are uh, the fifth and 95th percentile distribution functions for those particular uh, the, the, those, those classes. You can do the same thing for uh, salinity which looks a little like this. So never mind the narrowness here because the units on the bottom, they can be rescaled if necessary. And for machine learning, they will be rescaled anyway. So this is what uh, each one of the classes look like for 10 different types of uh, classes or clusters for the summer data from 1980 to uh, 2020. So these are, you can also think of them as eigen profiles that the rest of this stuff are, are built on top of. So each one of the ocean profiles then, from 1980 to 2020, should we say 2020, for the summer season, which we define as from July to September, are going to belong to one of those classes. And so we, which one they belong to, which one they have the highest probability of matching are the ones that they're projected to in terms of, uh, in terms of color to these one of these classes, which is uh, which are coded by color from zero to nine. So the zero and nine are not supposed to be the same color, but they're very close. Um, and you can see that generally speaking, this algorithm is able to, able to identify that um, uh, the, the inland the inland regions where there's predominantly fresh water and interfaces between um, tributaries into the ocean are one type of behavior, whereas further out into the ocean, you're migrating to something totally different. And up in the north, something different happens. So these are very interesting structures which are natural to the ocean itself and as detected through a data-driven approach. And for the spring season, it looks something uh, very similar, but there's less data coverage in the spring due to the sampling biases towards the summer when the, when the weather's nice and so on. Maybe that's part of the reason, I'm just guessing here. But you can see that the structure is also fairly similar and consistent in that the inland regions closer to the, uh, closer to the land mass are of one type of a cluster or two different types of clusters. And as you migrate further past the Vancouver Island region into the deeper, ocean, deeper oceans, the uh, structure changes. And this is consistent with what oceanographers know about the structure of the ocean in that uh, things like weather patterns, the, 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 the fluctuations in the salinity, temperature, and depth of these things control the thermodynamic state of the ocean. And this is something we'd like to be able to monitor and detect through, uh, through, uh, through, through the data itself. So here's a quick comparison of the spring and summer data in terms of their uh, clusters. So here, the mapping of the clusters to colors aren't absolute. So the two of them differ by um, uh, up, to a uh, up to a permutation. But beyond that, the structure is fairly similar. Maybe there's a slight difference in terms of how far away from the, the shore, generally speaking, is, is the transition towards more of this ocean looking thing. But I can't comment too much on that from my perspective. Um, one of the other cool things that we can do with this is because we'll have those different kind of classes or different kind of base profiles or, or clusters of 10 different types for summer and, and, the, uh, and, and spring, 
um, you can start to look at the profiles that which belong to one of those, uh, those classes because his maximum probability is projected on, along one of those classes, but which is the lowest of that class. So these, we can technically speaking, call them data outliers. So these are the ones which are profiles that are similar to others, but not the most similar. These are the, mo the, the most distally related for those classes. And this gives us a notion to be able to assess outliers in the ocean environment, which is very important for, for us to be identified, not only things like quality control, but if you have an abundance of outliers for a certain season, you know that there might be an anomalous event going on and we're starting to converge towards being able to detect things like the blob uh, and so on and so forth with uh, this kind of algorithm. But uh, that's not something we'll have tested just yet. It's more of a future direction. So these are clusters and each one of these, for example, here is a brown cluster, which is roughly around here, if you can see my cursor and this guy, Normally, uh, looking around at the, the different kind of data points that are around here should belong to a cluster which is more bluish in color, but itself is an out outlier, which suggests that this profile is closer in terms of um, its content to these brown clusters that are closer to the Vancouver Island region, but it's somehow found out here. So what's going on with that data point? Is this some kind of an issue with that particular data? Is this, is this a real oceanic, uh, oceanic anomaly? Well, those are the things that can be verified by scientists working in this particular domain. So this tool could become very useful for something like that. And here, similarly for the spring season from 1980 to 2020, uh, these are also some of the different kind of outliers that are observed. And uh, generally speaking, you're seeing uh, these, these different kind of things that belong in a cluster, but they just sort of barely belong in a cluster as relative to the, all the other members, uh, members of that particular class. So using this kind of technique, we can look at globally for all seasons from 1980 to 2020 around uh, this particular region. Uh, this geographical extent. And you can see that there are uh, quite a bit of outliers depending on what threshold you set the, the, the extent of outlier to. So if you set it really low, a lot of points will be detected. And if you set it to really high, then less points will be detected. And what the meaning is for these different kinds of uh, outliers is up to interpretation on a data point by data point basis because these are complex profiles. So to wrap it up, we have an ocean of data here at DFO, and this tells us a lot about the actual ocean itself. So we need to be able to find ways to be able to make use of this. And uh, this is one of the things that we have done here at for proof of concept three, which is to look at uh, CTD data that had uh, a very uh, four decades worth of coverage here in Canada. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Reham. Um, Let's just take uh, one question. Is there, if there are any questions for Rehem and, and Steve, we have time for just uh, perhaps one short question. I see there's a question in the chat about uh, reliability of. Um, measurement equipment, but uh, seems like Reham was able to address that or at least, uh, yeah, provided an answer. Okay, uh, in that case, uh, thanks again, Reham, Steve. Uh, we're gonna pass it now back to you, David. Uh, we're gonna spend the last 20 minutes of this uh, webinar looking uh, to the future and talking about uh, next steps, both at DFO and uh, we'll also uh, comment briefly on next steps for us at uh, Meridian. So please, David, uh, feel free to share your, your screen again. Okay, thank you. I am going to try this again. Hang on. Okay, can people, oops, here we go. All right, is that visible? Yep. All right, and people can see it changing? Not see, right now. No. Uh, you, so you, it's not, uh, you don't see the next steps? No, we're still at the first slide. All right, so, oh, here we go. Resume share, okay. Perfect. Perfect, next steps, okay. So um, I'm just going to speak really briefly. Um, as I mentioned during um, the, my introduction piece, uh, there's, there's a few drivers that are motivating the work that DFO has been doing with respect to the AI work. And um, one is to um, uh, improve, on, improve upon the results 
and the services that uh, the government of Canada is providing. Uh, another is to ensure that we're making best use of data and um, uh, uh, technology uh, to support digital transformation uh, and service modernization. And the, the third is to try and instill um, a culture of innovation and experimentation uh, within the government of Canada and within the department itself. Um, so in, in that regard, what we're hoping to do is uh, build upon the proof of concepts that uh, I've been discussed today and move towards next steps of moving from experimentation to implementation. So looking at the results of the proof of concepts and seeing to what extent we can uh, leverage, uh, leverage the, the work to develop automated decision systems and similar approaches to support decision making within programs in the department itself. Uh, I, I, key to this um, from an experimentation point of view is understanding what are the current uh, baseline results from um, uh, existing processes. So how well are we identifying managing uh, uh, illegal fishing activity, for example? Um, and then being able to understand by how implementing these processes, the um, uh, automated decision algorithms, AI, machine learning, uh, can we re improve on results and or reduce uh, resources and costs that are affiliated with that? Um, similar, uh, uh, in addition, we need to, um, if we are going to be implementing automated decision systems uh, to uh, within our work in the department, we need to understand um, what's the potential risk, what, what's the potential for bias. And so part of the work we're gonna be looking at this year is um, how to ensure that there's transparency, accountability, legality, fairness uh, within uh, automated decision-making and how to understand um, both how to identify, assess, and mitigate risk that might be um, associated with uh, bias in decision making. But as well, we're also interested in the extent to which um, algorithms can help us minimize human driven bias. Uh, uh, there's a lot of concern um, w with uh, uh, to the extent to which existing policies and processes have. Um, have differential impacts on different populations and different groups and gender based uh, analysis plus is increasingly important in the department. So one thing uh, in it, so in addition to understanding what sort of risk and bias might emerge from uh, algorithms and automated decision making, we also want to understand the extent to which it can help us uh, reduce bias that, that might emerge uh, from the human side. And finally, I um, you know, want to emphasize how so much of the work that we've been able to accomplish um, over the past year, uh, year and a half has been the result of uh, external partnerships and leveraging uh, external expertise and external talent um, at universities and with graduate students and with other interested partners to really help us um, advance this work and build upon the work that's already been done. And that's um, one thing that we want to continue to try to take advantage of moving ahead. Uh, so we're, we're, we, we look forward to continuing to identify partnerships and work with, um, you know, continue to work with the folks who uh, have helped us with the work so far. And we'd just like to make a, a bit of a pitch that, um, you know, if uh, there's any interest out there in working with us, in working with the department to uh, address uh, is issues of, uh, potential interest in the department um, and of interest to yourselves where you um, have expertise, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. I'd be, we'd be very interested in, uh, continue, in having that conversation and seeing the extent to which uh, you know, we can add, um, uh, you know, uh, develop and leverage partnerships to, to help us uh, improve how we continue to achieve and deliver on results uh, at uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So I'll stop there and um, uh, turn it back over to you, uh, Oliver. Thanks, David. Um, well, uh, we certainly are looking forward to uh, continue our collaboration with DFO. 
Um, so it's been a great pleasure in the last uh, two, even three years of Meridian's existence. We've been collaborating extensively with uh, DFO on both coasts and uh, uh, been working on some really exciting and I think important projects. So we're looking forward to continue that in, in the, the coming years. Um, on our side, uh, uh, we have, um, well, we, we're now uh, entering the, the, the sort of the final phase of, of the, the Meridian uh, project uh, as it was initially uh, conceived and funded uh, through a CFI cyber infrastructure grant. Uh, but we have uh, recently been awarded a new CFI grant um, uh, which will now uh, uh, allow us to continue our work uh, several years into the future. And, and so this is something we're very excited about. Um, our, uh, the PI, Stan Matwin, on the Meridian project, uh, also director of uh, the Institute for Big Data Analytics uh, at Dalhousie University, uh, was uh, not able to join the webinar today, but uh, Stan did record a short 10 minute uh, presentation uh, in which he talks uh, at a high level about Meridian uh, and uh, what we've accomplished so far and, and uh, where he sees uh, um, us going uh, in the next one or two years and beyond that as well. Um, and so I think uh, we're gonna end uh, this webinar by playing this uh, recorded presentation by Stan. Uh, and then uh, after that, we'll just have time for a, a very brief uh, um, final address uh, and, and uh, wrapping up uh, from me. Karen, Hi, oh, uh, sorry not to be able to join the group, uh, uh, but uh, in the case I haven't met uh, somebody who's on the call, uh, I'm Stan Matwin. I'm a professor of uh, computer science at Dalhousie University. Uh, I'm a Canada researcher in uh, machine learning and also the director of the Institute for Big Data Analytics at DAL. And uh, I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about our work. And in terms of the, the participation in the meeting, I'm sure Oliver will do a great job uh, uh, talking about the past, present, future. And I also wanted to thank, thank personally Jim Terrio for uh, making the connection. I hope everybody's doing well. I'm actually in Ottawa uh, waiting to be vaccinated. Uh, it is very slow here in Ontario, at least in Ottawa. And once that happens and the, the Nova Scotia bubble opens, I'll be immediately back at my desk uh, at uh, Dalhousie. For the time being, like everybody else, I'm fully operational on Zoom and all the other communicators uh, and, uh, you know, waiting for things to go back to uh, normal, although I think it won't be exactly the same as it uh, used to be. I wanted to talk to you now a little bit about uh, what we can do uh, perhaps together. And this is not just sort of an idea, but we have actually demonstrated that we have the know-how and we have achieved uh, specific uh, accomplishments and uh, uh, things uh, in that space of uh, data science and ocean data in the last two years. Um, uh, for that period, we were supported, maybe a little longer than two years, we were supported by the Canada Foundation of Innovation uh, Meridian Project, which essentially is a, a big ocean data project. Uh, it was uh, also sponsored by Nova Scotia, uh, Quebec, and British Columbia. Uh, to put it all together from three provinces and the federal government was great help and uh, incredible lesson in the, uh, uh, in the meanders of Canadian uh, uh, inter-provincial uh, and federal uh, relationships. In any event, uh, we managed to uh, button it all up and uh, we were working uh, between DAL, where uh, most of the resources, about 50%, were <clears throat> focused, and also uh, partnering with groups at Université du Québec uh, at Rimouski, with uh, Ivan Simard, who some of you may know. Uh, further west, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, collaborators in AI from uh, Simon Fraser University 
and University of British Columbia, Fred Popovich and Ray Ing at uh, Simon Fraser and UBC. And last but not least, Westmost, uh, Francis Juanes at University of Victoria, fish ecologist. And we also were lucky to get uh, strategic advice and sort of guidance from uh, Lindsay Dell at uh, Memorial University. So we kind of covered uh, coast to coast in terms of partnering. And what we have done is to develop tools, uh, specific software deliverables that are now in place that are and will be helping ocean scientists uh, to understand what is going on, both uh, under the water and uh, on the water, and uh, also to uh, learn what data is out there, kind of developing what I refer to uh, ocean yellow pages uh, for ocean data yellow pages that will tell you uh, where uh, there is data about oceans and on what basis uh, you could have access to it. And finally, we have also done a project uh, <coughs> uh, on some Great Lakes issues that I say a few words in a minute. So as far as the ship movements, we were working uh, mainly with AIS data. Uh, we have the data uh, that's to be to be known and remembered. <clears throat> and, you know, not many research groups in Canada have access to it. We have uh, a partnership with uh, Exact Earth. Uh, and under that partnership, we have uh, access to uh, their data with some geographic constraints, but that's all negotiable. Um, and we have kind of developed expertise in advanced data processing of that data, but particularly in machine learning using state-of-the-art methods uh, from that data and also helping uh, people out there, particularly from DFO, in uh, answering questions about ship movements in the area that interests them. So, for instance, we worked with, uh, we still are working with Claudio Di Bacco from uh, uh, DFO Bedford Institute for Oceanography, and uh, uh, we also worked with Chris Taggart at DAL, who uh, needed AIS data to uh, know about ship movements in the St. Lawrence area in order to uh, suggest uh, means of avoiding uh, whale collisions in, in this area. Um, for the ocean uh, data management, we have developed a, a data discovery portal that essentially is a, a metadata repository about ocean data. And uh, we would be very glad if you uh, had a look at it and uh, perhaps uh, also contributed uh, information about the data you have uh, to it. Uh, and finally, in the, uh, uh, in the Great Lakes area, we worked with uh, uh, Sarah Bailey from um, uh, uh, the Mississauga uh, Great Lakes Lab of uh, DFO uh, on the so-called ballast system. I won't go into too many details, but essentially we actually have in place uh, a working deployed operational system uh, that's used by Transport Canada inspectors from both West and East Coast on a daily basis for their work uh, as a tool to decide whether uh, ships ballast water will or will not be inspected and that whole system runs uh, as we speak uh, on a server that's sitting uh, 10 feet from uh, my office at uh, Dalhousie. Uh, so altogether all that work uh, underwater, uh, on the water, uh, uh, yellow pages for ocean data and the ballast uh, question for Great Lakes, uh, this was you know very well evaluated that uh, a uh, whole uh, spectrum of work we've done by uh, a, a group of independent peer reviewers uh, uh, when we were applying uh, earlier this year for continuation of Meridian. Uh, we were successful. The reviews were of the both the, the our demonstrated ability to do things, uh, useful things in this area and also what we propose to do. And we have uh, been able to uh, uh, successfully secure funding for the continuation of Meridian starting in September. Uh, that application, of course, was to a large extent uh, helped by Oliver, uh, who is with us here, and also by uh, Dr. at the beginning, the very beginning, at, uh, by Dr. Ines Hessler uh, from, uh, uh, at that time, Meridian and the Institute. Uh, and now we will be bringing six new uh, data science uh, full-time 
positions, uh, data science slash software development and software engineering positions that will be DAL based and we will have to go together perhaps 10 or 12 people here at DAL uh, working on issues that our colleagues from other uh, sort of uh, parts of ocean science, uh, oceanographers, biologists, uh, mathematicians and uh, uh, also uh, resources management people will bring to us and we will be assisting them with particularly AI-based solutions for uh, these problems. Uh, Oliver will tell you much more about specific projects uh, that we are just stating now for this Meridian 2.0. Um, and now is the time to discuss uh, potential partnerships and that's why I'm very happy that we have that meeting. And uh, uh, we will be doing that work uh, as part of the big vision we have for this uh, whole uh, area that we work in with Oliver and all the uh, many uh, PhD postdocs with uh, uh, data scientists like uh, Fabio, Matthew uh, and Bruno and uh, the new ones that will come. And our goal really, our vision is to uh, become, for our group, to become a go-to place globally uh, for data-driven artificial intelligence solutions to ocean issues. And this is uh, really where we want to get, and we're on the way there, and if we can work together, especially given uh, DFO's uh, uh, interest in applying AI uh, now uh, uh, on a larger scale in uh, solving uh, ocean problems uh, in our country that has the largest, uh, world's largest coastline, I believe, uh, uh, then, you know, we will have done our job. Thank you and hope to see you all uh, in person. Uh, stay well and uh, uh, the floor uh, it goes back to Oliver. So I'm afraid uh, we are um, out of uh, time here. So uh, although Stan hinted at uh, the short presentation that, that I would be giving. I think we're gonna skip that. Uh, Stan already did a, an awesome job at, uh, at um, outlining uh, where Meridian is heading next. Uh, and uh, if you wanna um, learn more about the specifics of what's in store, then uh, feel free to contact me uh, and, and, um, and I'd be happy to provide more details about where we see this going. Um, so we are at the very end now. Um, Reham or David, do you have any uh, final comments uh, or, or thoughts uh, at this point? Um, I would just like to thank again, uh, thank you again, Oliver, for the opportunity to present on the, the work that uh, we've been doing and also uh, give out a real big thank you to Jim uh, for all the support and help that uh, he has been uh, doing uh, to, to help, you know, drive us, drive us along and push us along and encourage us with our work. And uh, as well, acknowledge uh, Reham's uh, leadership uh, with respect to a lot of the work that uh, we've been doing with respect to, to AI. So, so thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, David. All right. Uh, so all that's left for me at this point is to uh, thanks uh, thank all the speakers uh, for their time and, and efforts. Thanks to uh, everyone attending. Uh, thanks for um, your active participation uh, in the chat box. Uh, there was a lively discussion taking place there, uh, which I'm thrilled about. And uh, as I mentioned initially, uh, we have been recording this webinar and uh, we will be making it available uh, through the Meridian YouTube channel in a week or so. And um, we will also be making the slides available through our website. Uh, and I think, uh, Kieran, could you just share the link to our website and our YouTube channel, perhaps in the chat for everyone. Um, thank you. So with that, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, I hope uh, this was useful or uh, interesting or both. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you again soon um, on Zoom uh, on another occasion. 
Thank you, Oliver. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Have a great, uh, great day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.